celebrating our Lord and Savior. And, and, and I derive great joy from this, uh, Reverend Grant. I, I love doing this once a year, for the most part, going to another church and showing off our little, you know, our little theology and, and the stuff that we were doing at our church. And I'm sure they derived the same thing of coming over to a uh, white pastor, coming over to a black church and, and showing, you know, you know what, what they're doing over there. Uh, on one occasion, I had the privilege of having one of the most distinguished preachers visit my pulpit while I visited his. We had no agenda. We just exchanged pulpits as usual. But unbeknown to me, his sermon title at my church was entitled, Jesus Doing His Father's Work. And, and the title I gave at his church, unbeknown to him, is the title I just gave you, Taking Care of God's Business. <laughs> it wasn't planned by us, but I'm sure it was planned by God. It was not the membership thought that we had plotted this, that we were going to talk about the same thing. But, but they assumed that, but it wasn't planned by us. But like I said, maybe God had planned it himself. But I imagine that his whole congregation wondered why I came across town, down the hill, over the railroad tracks, to talk to them about God's business. Some people can take a fist to that. And, 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 and I'm pretty sure uh, some of y'all are wondering here now, uh, why, Dr. Johnson, this is your last sermon as an interim pastor, why do you want to talk about taking care of God's bidding? I'm sure somebody here is probably saying, somebody here is probably questioning and saying, well, ain't he got something better? <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I, I thought the Lord would give him some good message today to preach on. I, I, somebody's probably saying, I, I, I can tell that he ain't been praying coming up with a message like that. I mean, what, what, what kind of message is that? I thought we'd be shouting up in here and making some noise. I, I want to hear him holler one more time. <laughs> That's probably what somebody's saying. Why, what, where does this message come from? However, church... If you look closely at the text, I'm sure you will find something to shout about. That, that, that's nothing, not, there's nothing greater and there's nothing can be higher or give us a higher reward than doing God's business. Uh, 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 to tell today's youth that is something of a, a moxyroron. I mean, they, they just can't get it. To, to tell today's youth that working for God is rewarding and beneficial is like trying to fly a kite in the middle of a hurricane. I mean, to tell church leaders to increase their leadership prowesses or leadership participation is almost like beating your head against a wall. To, to indicate to Christians that, 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 that there's more work needs to be done in a world where the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few is to invite criticism from those who believe that they're already doing too much. But in this, in this, this is exactly, my brothers and sisters, what I'm doing. <laughs> Simply because I believe that more is needed. With all the mess that's going on on the world today, I believe that if you got any Christ in you, it needs to show. Amen. If you got any love for God, now it's time for it to show. And in, in, in a world that's grown too comfortable dealing with hate and selling bigotry as if it is a necessary ingredient for human consumption, somebody needs to know that hate is no match for love. In forgotten and abandoned neighborhoods where children <clears throat> are being liked or being killed by stray bullets, teachers been shot in the classroom by six-year-old children, landlords are raising rents three and four times of what the unit is worth. Somebody needs to hear a word from the Lord. 
in a place that seems inescapable and full of uncertainty, somebody needs to know that God is the guiding force that leads them out of darkness into vision, into discipline, into moral courage, and to all the great things that God has designed for them. When the storms of life are raging, as we see in the U.S. Senate, and thank God they finally got uh, a House Speaker, uh, but when the storms of life are raging in the Senate, and especially among the GOP, the grand old party, <laughs> when the storms of individualism or collective individualism and commerce and inequality and mayhem and confusion and discontinuity and disinformation begin to break our spiritual quest for solidarity and peace with God, somebody, somebody say somebody, Somebody needs to shout from the rooftop that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. The tragic incident, check this out, the tragic incident of Buffalo Bills football player DeMar Hamlin is an example of what it's like to do God's or do the Father's business. I mean, if it, it, it is those people paramedics or if those paramedics or first responders had not arrived on the football field two minutes later the young man would not be here today his healing and recovery however was not just physical and medical but was also uh was also metaphysical it 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 it, 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 it the medicine had something to do with it <clears throat> But, but there's a sort of animated suspension of life where, where it seemed like his life was suspended for a moment and for a moment in time. And I know other people have experienced this before. This kind of suspension where, where, where the life forces kind of takes life away for a moment and then brings it back. This kind of this suspension happens at, at a time when, 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 when people... And everybody had their eyes on what might take place and what might happen. But I come to let somebody know it wasn't just the physical force that made this man walk again and speak again. It's the soul force that was involved in his life. The medical staff did their job, but you can't negate the prayers of millions of people from around the world and the impact that prayer has on our lives. So as much as I like modern medicine, I believe prayer is just as strong as prayer as medicine is. Anybody can agree with that? It was the prayers of people around the world that came together during this animated suspension period and brought this man's life back together. And so this conscious act that we did, when millions of people came together for one common purpose, this common act reminded us that God and humanity are in business together. That we work with God. <clears throat> While God is designing and, and beautifying and nurturing and planning and embellishing and crafting and creating, we should be putting God's plan into action. In the text, we read from Dr. Luke, and Luke is responsible for writing this historical view of Jesus' divinity, and he's also responsible for writing the book of Acts. Luke introduces us to a 12-year-old Jesus who is concerned about the things of God. And believe it, you know, at church, whatever concerns God ought to concern us. If God is concerned about it, then we ought to be concerned about it. Luke introduces us to a young scholar to a child phenon, a miracle child with, with, with exceptional abilities in spite of uh, uh, coming out of ghetto circumstance. <laughs> Some people say, what, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> can anything good come out of Newport News? Well, how about South Boston? Can anything good come out of South Boston, Virginia? Absolutely. And, 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 so, and so he introduces us to this, this phenon. We always talk about you know, LeBron James of the world, the phenons, and stuff like that. But, but Luke gives us a, paints a picture 
of Jesus and his exceptional ability. Jesus is presented as a boy who impresses doctors and the Jewish people of the law. The Jewish scholars, the rabbis, the rulers, the kings and queens. I mean, how many kings would send out a delegation to go find a boy child? How, how, how many people would do that? But Luke introduces us that and shows us how Jesus impresses those who are above him, the so-called rulers of the synagogue, the pastors and the potentates and the uh, apostles and the bishops. A 12-year-old child showed them something they'd never seen before. And, and this is not, my brothers and sisters, unusual when you consider that there are those during Jesus' day who were exceptional at a young age. Take, for example, many of the Roman heroes or heroic leaders, Caesar, Augustus, and, 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 and Herod, and all of those had, had exceptional skills around the age of 12. And I can go on. In Ethiopia, in African countries, around the time of Jesus, there were 10, 9, 11, 12-year-olds who were child prodigies, who were rulers of kingdoms. Jesus, in this case, is really no different from other child prodigies in his generation. In, in our own time, or a little bit before us, there, there were child prodigies who have amazed us with their gifts. Uh, Wolfgang Mozart, for example, was composing music by the age of four. The same goes for Stevie Wonder, who by the age of 12 was recording music and performing professionally under the name Little Stevie. I don't know if there's anybody old enough to remember that. Okay, somebody, somebody said they remember. Amen. We got one person in here who remember that. <laughs> Amen. Anybody else want to raise their hand so they remember that? Okay, we got more hands now. All right. Little Stevie started his thing at 12. Now, now don't forget what I said. He was recording and on the, on the, on, on the tour at the age of 12. Uh, um, um, it is said that, that, that William Cullen Bryant, the great poet, and along with Phyllis Wheatley, the published uh, poet, they had published poems before the age of 10. Picasso made his first oil painting at the age of nine. But, 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 but that's just a sidebar, my brothers and sisters, and not the real story. Luke, 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 Luke just teases us and drops some knowledge on us about, 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 about the one that he loves and adores so much. What, what is important here is not the child prodigies and what they can do at an exceptional age. What is important here is what Jesus does and how the people respond to what he does. You probably already know the story. And I'll just give you a little background. Jesus is with a caravan of people who left his hometown of Nazareth and they traveled about 30 miles on foot to Jerusalem. And, and that ought to be enough for those of us who are trying to get a three-mile walk in. Um, <laughs> they walked 30 miles, uh, you know, uh, so I'm just saying that. So your three miles, you know, compared to that. Okay, all right, I'll move on. Um, and so they traveled by foot to Jerusalem for one of three festivals that they had to do, choir, one of three. And, and, and um, it was required of all the males at a certain point to attend at least one of the festivals and participate in at least once a year. It was part of their culture to attend these festivals according to Exodus 23, 14. There were three festivals. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread. That's the kind of bread that we eat during communion. The Feast of the Harvest of First Fruits. That, that's when they brought their first fruits at the beginning of the year unto God. I'm sure, I'm wondering if anybody's done that already yet. Y'all didn't forget y'all first fruits of the year. Now, it's not your tax payment to the government. <laughs> your first fruits is to God first. You can pay the government in April. <laughs> but we're talking about January. And, and so it's a feast of the first fruits and a feast of ingathering. I love this ingathering because this is a part <clears throat> of, of their culture and a reminder of what God is and what God has done for them and has done for them in their lives. So they 
They kept the cultural mandates. They kept uh, believing. They kept trusting. They kept going back to these festivals to remind them of where God had brought them from. They didn't forget their heritage. They didn't forget their culture. They refused to forget where they had come from and, and, and what, what, what their national identity was who had brought them over the 400 years of captivity and bondage in Egypt. They never forgot that. They, they knew that God had made it possible for them to be where they were now. And, and before uh, I move on, I want to remind us that we all not forget our own heritage and where we come from and, and where God brought us and how he made us and how he kept us and led us and fed us. I, I, we should not forget how God had made a way for us as an Afro people. I mean, we can continue to celebrate everybody else's culture and forget about our own. I mean, sometimes I believe we co-opt a little bit too much. We're so busy trying to fit into a society that for too long has dissed us. Come on, somebody. Has dissed us that we have forgotten how strong and mighty we are as a people. Now, I don't, I don't I, I'll be honest with you. I don't mind celebrating St. Patrick's Day. I don't mind putting on a little green. But sometimes I want my white friends to put on a dashiki. <laughs> Amen. I, 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 I want them to help me celebrate black history. If you want me to put on some green and march in the parade, then you come and help me celebrate Kwanzaa. Come on, somebody. We, we, we can't forget what mom and them did and, and how they brought us this far, how much blood was spilled for us to be here today, how many lives have been lost, how many sacrifices have been made for us to get where we are today. And, and, and we have to remind ourselves that the festivals and the celebrations that we have, we must keep them on and keep remembering. Stony the road we trod. We can't forget that. How God has brought us over and there were some stony roads. We can't, we can't sit here and look all pretty and all cute and don't think that the roads were not stony. Bitter the chest and rod. We can't forget that. How, how God brought us over and, 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 and Jesus' people in this text shows us that they did not forget where they came from and what God had done for them. And, and so while traveling, they were talking about the good old days. You know how it is when you're in a caravan of people and you're traveling and you, let's think about you walking with a hundred people and, and they're in the crowd. They're talking about the good old days. They just left the festival. They're on their way back home. They had a good time for three days or, or, or would it have a long, it's a whole week, but I think they stayed about three or four days. And, 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 and so, and so they're talking among themselves. They, they're talking about the events of the festival. You know how we do. We talk about who we saw and what people purchased and women showing off their pocketbooks and, and shoes and, you know, things that they got. You know, I got this real cheap and, you know, well, you paid too much for that or you should have saw my guy when you were there. You know, you know all that kind of chatter, what's going on, who performed well, and, 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 and the amazing things they saw and heard, who was a guest preacher, who preached the most, who gave the best sermons, and all of that stuff. They were talking about on the way. And, and, and while they were walking, however, uh, uh, and, 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 and made it home, Mary and Joseph noticed that something was missing in their lives. Somebody, somebody who was supposed to be with them was not there. And Mary, Mary pushed the panic button. And, 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 and I know that, that, that somebody in here is probably saying, Brother Witherspoon, somebody's probably saying, that somebody should have called social services on Murray and Joseph for not keeping up with their 12-year-old. <laughs> I know somebody saying it in their mind. How come you can't keep up with a 12-year-old boy? You don't walk all the way home, 30 miles away, and now you recognize that he ain't there. I mean, come on, y'all. 
Come on, y'all. Most of us can't go 10 feet without our cage somewhere around us, and we're ready to call somebody. Put out a search party. And, 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 and I know y'all got a hold of this, but let me, let me just say this. The caravan that, 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 that they traveled with was a mixture of family, church folk, friends, community persons, and the like. So, so, so in their defense of Joseph and Mary, they, they, while, while they were traveling and talking, Mary and Joseph probably thought Jesus was, 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 was with the kinfolk. Or, you know, playing games with the other children. They, they, they were not concerned about kidnappers and molesters and all them folk. They were just worried about, you know, they were just going about their business. So, so you really can't fault them per se. But I know in our culture we got to blame somebody, right? <laughs> Mary and Joseph searched everywhere and could not find him. They discovered that Jesus was not on board. They, they had walked all the way home, all the way back to Nazareth, and they discovered that Jesus was not on board. And, and let, me just, let me just say something here. I don't know about you, church, but I don't know how Mary and Joseph went that long without noticing that Jesus was not on board with them. I don't know how they could go three days, the Bible says, without knowing that, that, that Jesus was not with them. And, and I want to park the car right here and, and ask you a question. How many of y'all can go three days without Jesus? How, how many of y'all can go a day without Jesus? How, how many of y'all can go a midnight without Jesus? How many of y'all can go that long without knowing that Jesus is the missing piece in your life? How many of y'all in here can go without knowing that Jesus is not on board? I, I got news for somebody. I don't know about you, but I got to have him every day, every Every second, every moment of my life, uh, Jesus has to be on board with me. And I know somebody in here right now, you're probably wondering, that, is he missing in your life or where he, is he right now? But I got news for you. He's right among you. He's in you. He's with you. He's a part of you. And I can't let, I, I read a song the other day, heard it and it said, I can't let a day go by without praising his name. I can't let a day go by without acknowledging who he is. I need about 15 people in here who can stand on their feet and testify. You can't let a day go by without praising his name, without giving him glory, without thanking him. Come on, y'all. We, we can't let it go by without knowing and let me tell you something. How many of y'all know when Jesus is missing in your life? Because you start messing everything up. Ain't nothing going out right. Ain't nothing happening. Everything you try does not work because he is not on board with you. We know that. Every time you get out of whack, every time you get confused, every time there's discontinuity in your life, it's because Jesus is not on board. But I got news for you. If you stop and think for a moment and start praying and start believing and start praising and breaking back on board with you Jesus we'll make it right for you come on give God a hand clap of praise <coughs> I can't let a day go by without praising his name and let me tell you I, I, I know what Mary and Joseph felt like because Jesus is the missing piece in our lives I mean all of us have this sort of existential emptiness on the inside of us, we have these psychic scars, these ontological wounds that only Jesus can heal. It's, it's the pneumatology of the spirit that kind of brings us back in check with God and, and not leave us on an island of, a lonely island of despair but bring us back in a connectivity with God. And the reason why a lot of us ain't getting what we want because there's a disconnect. Mary and Joseph were disconnected from the heir apparent of God, they were disconnected from the things that God could do. And, and let me tell you, if you're disconnected today, you, you need to find a plug somewhere. It's like having a power cord that's gone out and you don't know where your power source is coming from. 
You're trying to find the cord, but you can't find it. But let me tell you, in order to be connected with God, you got to find your power source, and you need to get reconnected with God. Anybody missing him today? I know you are. Anybody on Facebook or, or YouTube or wherever you today, if you're missing Jesus, you have to be like Mary and Joseph. You got to turn around. <laughs> oh, I feel like preaching this thing here. You got to turn. They got home. They didn't go in the house. They didn't go looking to fix dinner. They didn't go get a drink of liquor. They turned that body around and they walked back. And I know in somebody's life, maybe you left him somewhere, but I got news for you. You need to pack up and go back, do a U-turn. Go back and find out where you left him at. Find the location, find the place that you left God and go back and put him back on your plane, put him back on your boat, put him back on your car, put him back in your life. I can't let a day go by without praising my Jesus. Too many of us are letting life pass us by without having Jesus a part of our life. When, when they found him, uh-oh, I just said something. See, y'all miss y'all shout. I just said when they found him. <laughs> See, when you go back, you can find him. Because the Bible tells us those who seek after him will find him. Another verse says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. So if you're looking for him, you can find him. There's no excuse for anybody. If you're looking, you can find him. Do I have a, a testimony here? <laughs> if you're looking for him, you can find him. The Bible says they, they said that, that he was in the temple. They found him. And I want to relate this message to somebody here today so bad that he can be found. If you find your life, something's missing in your life, I can tell you Jesus is a missing piece. And if you seek him right now, he can find you. Whether you find him or he finds you, it really doesn't matter. <clears throat> and so the Bible says that, that, that when they went back, Jesus was in the temple. I mean, he was not... He was not hanging out at a Jerusalem shopping mall looking for a pair of Air Jordan. He was not on the street corner hanging out with the fellas. He was not sightseeing or playing soccer. He was in the temple. He, he, he went to church. He, he was talking about God and the things that mattered the most to God. And when they found him, he was talking with the scholars, the rabbis and showing off his brand new intellect. Jesus, when they found him, he was intellectualizing, spiritualizing, and contextualizing, and providing or proving that there was something special and amazing about him. You ever meet people where you just know there's something special about them? I mean, really, I mean, I, we can say that about all of us, right? <clears throat> there's something unique and special about everybody in here. So when you meet somebody, somebody always knows something you don't know, right? And, and so all of us are special, right? And so every time we meet one another, we meet somebody who's special, somebody who's unique, somebody who's different, and that's a good thing. They, they, but, but, but check this out, check this out. Mary is worried about her baby, and, and when she found him, and as I said, that's another clue for us right there that she found him. And then she found him when she found her baby. She said to him in the Bible, you know, Jesus, me and Pop's been all over <laughs> looking for you. I, I, I mean, we, we, we went all the way to Nazareth. And we thought you was with the kinfolk. We thought you were playing with the other children. We, we've been looking for three days. 
and, 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 and why have you treated us like this? We, 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 we've been searching everywhere. That's what the Bible said. And, and some scholars dispute the fact that Mary was real polite, Sister Brown. They said, Mary, Mary, said the Bible is doing Mary a little justice here. Like, you know, she just smoothed it over. But somebody said Mary was mad. Mary was angry with Jesus. Where you been, boy? And, 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 and so Mary's voice was not as calm as it looks, as it looks here in the Bible. And this, and this is where I'm, I already parked the car. I'm going to dock a boat right here. Uh, Jesus was surprised his mother's, of his mother's reproach. But, but Mary got a right to ask, right? Where you been? And, and I could imagine one of our mothers leaving us. We leaving one of them and staying somewhere behind. I mean, I mean, come on. They ain't gonna be this polite. I know my mama would have. They, they, what they used to do is just grab you by the hand. Now, now we could be out in the shopping mall. We could be downtown, and you act up. Mama say, "Wait till you get home." I imagine Mary was probably saying that. You know, we're gonna when I get you home. Now that's the way Mama used to do. Boy, you can't go. Mama would stop shopping. Her only focus would be getting you home. <laughs> Am I right about it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Nothing else matters right now but getting your butt home. Call me a cab. I need to get this boy home. I know I'll pay that bill tomorrow. I need to get him home. That's it. And she dragged in that house and that's the, that's the end of you for the, for the rest of the day. You can't sit down. <laughs> you can't lay down. You just go over in the corner somewhere and start crying. Oh, mama. Don't hit me no more, mama. <laughs> but, but, surprisingly, Jesus was surprised at Mary and Joseph because he assumed that they would understand that they didn't have to search far for him because the only place that he would be would be in the temple. And so he's saying that while you're searching for me, Jesus said, you don't have to search because there's only one place where I'm going, and that's going to be the church. You don't have to look in beer halls. You don't have to look on corners. You don't have to go to your cousins. You don't have to go anywhere. All you have to do is go to the temple because that's what the Father has sent me to do. And one would wonder why Mary didn't think about that. She knew she was raising the Messiah. She knew that he would be Lord of Lords and King of Kings one day, but yet on this occasion, she kind of lost it. She forgot about who Jesus was. She forgot that he would probably be in the temple doing something, doing some of God's work. And, and, and so he's in the temple under a divine compulsion, under the spirit of God's power. He, he was not the Jesus we would call the Messiah that will come later. He was not the Messiah or the Savior. That's going to come. But he was giving a testimony that this day will come, that his time, his day will come. And 18 years later, Reverend Perkins, 18 years later, at the age of 30, Jesus begun his public ministry. It was short-lived, 33 years, but it made the greatest impact that anybody can ever make in three years. But for now, at 12, being in the temple was enough. And Jesus' response to his parents was not disrespected by any way. Like kids disrespect us today. I can imagine what that six-year-old kid is like. Can you imagine raising something like that? That would take a gun to school and shoot. I mean, imagine trying to raise that. That's either dysfunction in the house. Somebody ain't doing a good job. First of all, put the gun away so they can't get it. Hey, man, I ain't, I'm not against gun ownership. I, I, look, I got one too. But I ain't, I'm, I'm just saying, I, put it up. My, my kids are grown. They don't even know what mine is. I'm glad they don't. 
<laughs> I ain't going to tell them where's that either. Y'all, y'all, y'all get mad at daddy, y'all have to go get, y'all have to, have to throw, throw a pot at me or something. That's about it. <laughs> but, but imagine that kind of stuff in a parent's life and having to deal with. So Jesus was not being disrespectful. He, he, he wondered why they didn't know where he was. His response was, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? And this is where I get ready to land a plane, uh, First Baptist Church, Denby. This is where I leave you. This is where I tell you that I got to go. I got to get out of here. But I want to suggest to each of you that no matter what you do, be about taking care of God's business. Jesus, notice Jesus said it's his business that we take care of, not our business, but God's business. Your salvation is God's business. Your redemption is God's business. Your restoration is God's business. Everything you do is God's business. And I've got to leave, as I say, but First Baptist, take a page from a 12-year-old prodigy. Be about doing God's business. As you go into the new year of 23, be about doing God's business. As you try to move forward with new, with new creativity and new ambience, be about doing God's business. As you look into the future and see what the future holds, be about doing God's business. Jesus said, I'm doing my father's business. And, and what is the father's business? Uh, uh, it's preaching the word in season and out of season. Uh, uh, being Doing God's work is it, it, praying, praying for the unsaved. Doing God's work is seeking the lost. It's clothing the naked. It's finding shelter for the homeless. It's, re- it's finding peace for the rejected. It's finding love for the neglected. It's finding home for the mistreated. It's finding peace for the abandoned. It's doing ministry for the battered and the approved. That is doing God's business. Can I get a witness in here that that is all about doing God's business? Having a stable and reliable government that protects and serves the people is God's business. Finding health care for those who need it is God's business. Protecting the rights of innocent children is God's business. Treating people with dignity and respect is God's business. Respecting immigrants who come to this country seeking a fresh start is God's business. Paying fair wages is God's business. Increasing the inequality level among the races is God's business. Respecting the privacy of others is God's business. Church business is God's business. And how you handle it is God's business. Loving your neighbor is the father's business. God's business is saving a dying world. The great commission that God gives us is to go ye into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And lo, I will be with you even into the end of the age. That is the great commission. That is God's business. For Jesus, Jesus said he must do God's business. No, it was not something he wanted to do. He said, I must do the Father's business. And Jesus often uses the word must. Check it out in Luke 4, 34. He said, I must preach the gospel. In Luke 9 and 22, he said, I must suffer for the rights of others. In John 3, 14, he said, I must be lifted up. And, and he moved on with a must. So for Jesus, doing God's business is a must. And I just stopped by to tell you, First Baptist, doing God's business is it's a must for you. If you want to be blessed, uh, if you want to be healed, uh, if you want to be great, uh, if you want to move to another level, let's do God's business. Uh, anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been about doing God's work? Uh, have you been busy doing his work or busy doing somebody else's work? Let's get on board. Uh, come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, let's put Jesus on board. Uh, let's find him uh, and let's make him a part of everything we do. Jesus said, I must do God's business. And how many people in here feel 
uh, propelled or feel compelled to do God's work? Are you ready to do God's will? Are you ready to do God's work? I'm talking about the God that died for you, the God that saved you, the God that lifted you, the God that you owe everything to. Are you ready to do the work of the Savior? Somebody say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Are you ready to do God's will and God's work? Jesus says, I must, I must be about doing God's business. You can do all the other kind of business in the world. But God's business is the greatest business you will ever do. Only what you do for Christ will last. I'll forget what you do for me. Y'all will forget what I do for you. But it's only what you do for Christ that will last. And I feel good about this day. I feel good about you. I feel good about your direction and where you're going. But I know the greatest thing I can tell you today, that it be about doing God's business. Jesus says so plainly, I must be about my father's business. Let's leave all the politics and gossip and all that stuff aside. And let's think about what God is taking us. God can take you to new heights. I mean, look at the benefits of doing God's work. Blessings showering down upon you. The benefits of doing God's work is, 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 is having connectivity with a God who loves you. The benefits of doing God's work is saving a dying world. The benefits is, is helping people in your community live better and do better and be better. The benefits of doing all of that is that God is with you. Even the, the least amount of stuff you do, God is with you. The Bible says do not despise the days of small beginnings because God is always with us no matter what it is that we do. Behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the day. Jesus said, I never leave you, nor will I forsake you. That is the gospel in miniature. That, that, is, that is our biological connection to the gospel. That Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. He demands that we be about doing his business. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Come on, let's thank God. Come on, stand on your feet. Let's thank God for, for what we are doing and how God has done it for us. Somebody was singing a song the other, the, earlier. I will trust in the Lord. Here, can we do a little bit? I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. How many of y'all trust him today? Come on, don't fool me now. How many of y'all trust him today? How long will you trust him? We're going to open the doors of the church. There may be somebody in here today looking for a church home or looking to be baptized or looking for a place to settle down. We want to open the doors up to you today. Come on, sing it like you mean it. How long will you do it? There's one here today. If you're here, why don't you come? Candidate for baptism. Candidate for membership. Come on, will you trust him today? Come on, put your hands together and say, I will trust him this day what he's about to do, what he's doing, and how he's going to do it. I'm going to trust in the Lord. Oh, yeah. I will trust him. How long will you do it? How long?
How long will you do it? Come on, don't fool me now. Will you do it that long? Will you hold on that long? Will you trust God that long? Until you die, will you trust Him that long? Yeah. On the battlefield. Why don't you come up to the altar? We do our altar prayer, and I think we'll be ready to leave and go over to the fellowship hall. I want to pray for the congregation one last time before my departure here. Why don't you come join me here? Come on, sing it loud, choir. take place in your life and get ready to take place in all of our lives. The great things that God's getting ready to do. How many, this song earlier asked you, how many of y'all believe that God is getting ready to do that thing in your life? Yeah. This is a new year for us, a new beginning for y'all, new beginning for me, all of us. We need to be in prayer for one another. We be, need to be in solidarity. We need to lift each other up. We need to praise each other, bless each other, do everything according to God's word to help lift each other up. The Bible said the church is given to edify the saints, to lift you up, to give you the tools you need so you can be a better Christian, a better saint, a better person. Give you everything you need. And I believe that this church has all the gifts that you need to be the person, the individual that God wants you to be. It's here. And not only is it here, but it's in you. The church is not the building. You are the church, each one of us. God has given us the power to make right the power to do great things. The power is within you. Come on, just reach over and tell somebody, you got the power, baby. It's in you. Why don't you bow your head with me? Father God, we thank you for another day of fellowship. We thank you for another day of learning and listening, of great songs and dancing. We thank you for the second Sunday of a new year that you've ushered us into. We thank you for providing for us for another week, for another day, for another moment, for waking us up this morning, getting us started on our way. We thank you, Lord, for the people in our lives who you birthed into our lives, the people that we've grown to know. We thank you for the church family, the institution of the family itself. We thank you, Lord, for this branch of Zion and what you've done so far and what you will continue to do as it moves forward. Thank you for the great men and women, God, who has been a part of my life while here at this church. I thank you for the great men and women who have came here and joined to lift this place up. Those who have been baptized here and now looking to flourish and move forward. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters who are standing here today not knowing
Ain't nothing but the devil trying to turn my mic off. That's all it was. But God, we thank you for what you have done in the life of the saints right here at First Baptist Denby. How you have ushered in a new spirit, a new era, a new type of anointing that's on this place. Well, we pray for one another and lay hands on one another, put oil on one another, do all the wonderful things for one another right here. God, we thank you today for your love and, and your majesty. We thank you for the privilege of being able to stand before your altars. We thank you for the privilege and the honor to be able to call you Father, Abba, our Father. We thank you for the honor, oh God, for allowing us to, to fall on our knees and call upon you in times of trouble. We thank you, Lord, for hiding and shielding us from our enemies. We thank you, Lord, for being our protector. We thank you, Lord, for holding us under the wings of your arms. We thank you, God, for being the Lord of our salvation, for being the bishop of our soul, for being someone we can all we stink and love and pray. We thank you, God, for entering into our life. And we thank you, God, that we found you somewhere on a dusty road and wherever we may have been. We're glad we found you, that you are part of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for educating us, for feeding us, God, for just being the Lord of our salvation. We thank you, God, for all the wonderful things you provided in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for what we have and what's going to come our way. You said, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard of the great things that's going to come our way. God, we thank you right now. We thank you, Lord, for lifting us up on high. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the things and the desires of our heart. We thank you, Lord, for being great and wonderful and exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ever hope or think. God, we love you today, and we thank you right now. God, we just want to shout it out right now that we love you, God. We appreciate you, God. We thank you, God. We give you praise today, God. We give you all the love that we have right now and God we rejoice in you today and we just thank you right now for all the great things that you are doing in our lives we thank you Lord for this day I pray God for those who are standing here looking for work, looking for employment, looking for careers, looking for something different and something amazing to happen in their lives. God, my prayer is that you will infuse them with everything that they are looking for. The things that they are praying for will not go unnoticed. The things that they are seeking, God, will not go unfound. The things that they are looking for, God, will not be out of the ordinary. But God, you will enclose them. You will build a fence all around them and protect them along the way that you will give them the desires of their heart. Your word says anything we ask in your name, God, you will do it for us. And now God, I say do it for the saints in here. Do it for the people standing here. Do it for the unemployed. Do it for those, God, who are homeless. Do it right now, God, for those who need you. Do it, God, with those with broken homes and broken families and broken marriages, God. Do it right now, God, for somebody standing here that needs you. Somebody with a reputable mind. Somebody about to lose Lose their mind because of all the things they're going through. Help them, Lord. Bring their mind back into reality. Bring their thoughts back into reality. Bring their wholeness back into your fold, God. Lift them up right now. Touch them right now. Let them not leave here not knowing that there is a God that sits high and looks low. That there is a God that can make a way out of no way. That there is a God that can make a highway in the middle of a desert. That there is a God that can turn the crooked street straight, uh, that there is a God that can lower every mountain and make every molehill a mountain, that there is a God uh, who can do amazing things. Uh, is there anybody in here who know that God can work it out? Uh, God can fix it. Uh, God can make a way. Uh, God can do God's thing. If you let God do it, somebody say yeah. Say yeah. God can fix it for you. He can make a way for you. Say yeah. Say yeah, say yeah, God can and God will make a way for you today. He's our God, he's our God who birthed us, who brought us. We're made in his image in the Imago Dei, he, we are made in God's image. God made us, he birthed us, he brought us here and we are loved by God and we can all have the things of God. We can all believe that God will bring us the desires of our heart. 
There's nothing that's missing that God cannot give us. There's nothing that's absent in our life that God cannot provide. There's nothing you don't have that God cannot give you. There's, 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 there's no health problem that's too great for God. There's no, there's no criminal records or anything too amazing for God. God can work anything out. God can fix anything. I don't care where you are. You can be in a narrow jail cell. You can be lying in a hospital bed. You can have all kinds of health issues. But there is a God who's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory. There's a God that healeth the land. A God that healeth your body. A God that can heal everything about you. And God, we speak life right now into the life of everybody here. We speak life and not death. We speak, oh God, that you are a healer. You are a way maker. You can heal every situation, no matter what the doctors have said, no matter what people say, no matter what psychologists say, no matter what philosophers say, no matter what anybody say, what mama says, the daddy says, God, we know that you are able to heal the land. You're able to do great things. And God, we thank you right now. We thank you, Lord, for healing us. We thank you for finding jobs. We thank you for promotions today. We thank you for the cars we drive, the houses we live in, the food we eat, the, the jewelry on our necks, uh, the furs on our back, the gators on our feet. God, we thank you right now for being the God of our salvation. We praise you now. And God, we give you thanks for every man, woman, child in here. We pray for their families. We pray for the little babies I see in here today, God. And families will raise them up in the way they should go and they will not depart from us. We praise you now, God, for everything in our lives right now. And we know that we're not perfect, God, but we know that, God, you're going to do something amazing for us. You're going to lift us up, God, and give us the things we've been praying for and lifting for and looking for. All those New Year's resolutions are going to come to pass because, God, we know you're going to make it happen. You're a God that makes things happen. And we are glad about that. You're not a, a lottery machine. You're not a slot machine. But we know you're a God that can make things happen. Won't he do it, somebody? Is there anybody here that know God can make things happen? That God can work it out? I don't care what it is. We serve a God who can work it out. Can he do it? I need about 15 people to raise their hands up because I know God can work it out in my life because he's already done. God's got a good track record. Don't he have a good track record? He's got a good resume. God can fix it for you. God can work it out for you. God can do it for you. Don't leave here without thinking that God can't do what God said God can do. He's got a record of doing amazing things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Come on, let's put our hands together and say amen. Come on, say amen again. Come on, say amen again. Come on, say amen again. Come on, say it like you mean it. Amen. Amen. Do we have anything else to do here? You want to give notice to everybody? We're going over to the fellowship hall. And there are going to be some refreshments and, you know, y'all can bring y'all checks on over next door. <laughs> I, I, I got a basket I'll be waiting. So to, let's lock the doors in here. Nobody go out the back door. Everybody going out the front. <laughs> Amen. But thank you all. Let me give the benediction before you leave. Let me give the benediction before you leave. Thank you all so much again. Thank you all so much, First Baptist Denver. I'm going to miss y'all. Don't forget to invite me back sometimes. Amen. 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 And I pray for your new pastor as he comes. And I hope to get a chance to meet him before I leave. And I thank God for what y'all have done. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. We thank you for this great day, the day that you have made, and your desire for us to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for the saints of God, the love of the fellowship, and the communion of the saints. We thank you for this branch of Zion that will continue to be blessed as long as it continues to do the Father's business. And now to him who's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory, to the only wise God, be power, 
glory and dominion now henceforth and forevermore. Let the people of God say amen. Come on, say it one more time. Amen. Come on, one more time for me. Amen.